So please give a big hand for Jason Porthouse. Hello. Hi. Can you all hear me okay? My Britney's working. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, it's good to see so many familiar faces, as ever, and some new ones too. When Andy asked me to uh, put this talk together, I sort of started about six months ago, and I found it really, really difficult, because stuff is just happening so quickly at the moment. Am I, you know, you, you get a sense of this in the collective that we're just being bombarded with ever-shifting sands underneath us. And uh, I called the talk Society in the Self, which sounds a bit highfalutin, but it, essentially, my thought around this is to do with what I see as a bit of a sort of identity crisis, both in terms of individual people and our collective in terms of society as well. Um, and a lot of it is to do with this sort of ever seemingly more chaotic world in which we live. Um, people are feeling confused, alienated, not sure of their place in the world. And I'm, I'm sort of talking more about the West here rather than elsewhere. Um, and our lifestyle and our way of life tends to feed into this. Um, we are bombarded on an ever more frequent basis with all sorts of pressures, all sorts of influences that are coming into our lives. And, you know, obviously, there's a few of them here. The sort of pressures of consumerism, of, of living in a very consumerist society, um, how that defines ourselves. You know, we, I shop, therefore I am. Um, a lot of people are very much in that, that worldview where they're sort of defined by the things that they consume, by the things that they buy. And this is a constant in our lives, advertising, the media are constantly sort of bombarding us with these different ideas of who we can be, of lifestyles that we can aspire to and things that we can attain if we only get the right stuff, if we only use the right deodorant, if we only you know, were to buy the right sort of food or wear the right clothes. We've got the media, as opposed to advertising, doing the same thing with our feeds into our homes all the time. So, you know, we, we're watching television, and obviously increasingly now on other media as well, like social media, you know, all of us have got tablets, platforms, and all the rest of it. So we're kind of constantly assailed with differing ideas and very contradictory ideas a lot of time um, that don't tend to make any sense to us. There's no sort of cohesive whole. And I think this fosters in people an identity crisis. It's almost a bit like a kind of a midlife crisis, you know, the traditional idea of a midlife crisis, but it's on a wider collective level as well. Um, and obviously world events they are in, in sort of in seemingly, like I said before, increasing at this sort of exponential rate where crises upon crises are happening, where our response to them is, is either woefully inadequate or completely over the top. Um, and again, how do we respond to that as individuals and the collective? How do we actually um, respond to things which seemingly there are no easy answers to and feel way, way too big to actually tackle? And... Uh, I've often wondered whether this is just chance, if it's happenstance, or whether there is something else going on. Um, now, some of you will know of this guy if you are fans of Adam Curtis, the documentary maker. Anyone here ever watched his stuff? Ooh, one or two hands going up. If you haven't seen his films, you need to see them. They are fantastic because they take a look at the way our world is manipulated through the lens of the media. Um, and I would just recommend, you know, write his name down, Google him, most of the stuff's online. It needs to be watched. They're not easy viewing, but they're fantastic. And uh, 
in his last film, Bitter Lake, he talked about the guy on the left here. Most of you won't have heard of him. His name's Vadislav Surkov, and he is a sort of right-hand man to Vladimir Putin in Russia, and he has a really interesting background. His background is actually in conceptual art, but he is one of Putin's closest advisors in terms of political strategy for Russia. He's kind of like a Damien Hirst type figure in Russia. And the really interesting thing about him is that he has quietly, behind the scenes, for many years now, been funding different groups in Russia and setting up different groups. But the interesting thing about these groups is that they're not cohesive in any sense. He will fund a sort of almost neo-Nazi fascist organization and be um, um, promoting them and sort of giving them airspace to sort of them. But he will also fund an equally progressive student organization, which is at the polar opposite, okay? So there's this whole kind of thing going on in Russia whereby this guy is actually creating all of these different groups that have very, very different political outlooks, completely contradictory, fighting against one another. And the fascinating thing about the fact that this is going on is not so much the fact that he's doing it, but that he let everybody know exactly what he was doing. So now people in Russia know that this guy is funding all these different sort of organizations and grassroots sort of campaigns and things like that that are completely at loggerheads with one another. What's that done? Well, it's created a complete sense of confusion in their system. And the overall effect is people sort of just shrug their shoulders and go, oh well, we know we can't trust anything because it's being manipulated. Now, does this happen here? Hmm. Hard to say. I don't think there's any one particular figure like him in our society that's sort of pulling the strings in quite the same way that he is. But we do have a very, very biased media. And I say that as somebody who works in the media and um, for a long time has been a very passionate advocate of things like the BBC. I can't say that that's the case anymore because I think that it's become incredibly biased along with all the rest of our media. So, one of the biggest sort of things for me in the past few months that sort of speaks to this idea of a sort of a disconnect, of, of a crisis in terms of self-identity and, and the collective identity, um, I hate to bring it up quite so early on in the <laughs> symposium, but it's got to be talked about, you know, is Brexit. Um, I'm not going to go into the pros and cons of this because that, you know, I know Andy's going to talk about it tomorrow um, in a slightly different way. But for me, what's interesting about the vote that we've just had in the aftermath of it all um, is really the reaction of people running up to the vote because we know that there was a lot of disinformation on both sides, and I'm not making a judgment here. You know, the, the information that we, we were fed through our media was completely unclear and very, very sort of, you know, outright lies quite a lot of the time on both sides. Um, but the result of the referendum was a complete surprise to both sides. I think that those people that voted Remain just expected it to be carried through and that was it. And equally, those people that voted Leave, they didn't really expect to win. You know, you had Farage on the night of the thing, sort of going, going oh, well, we tried. And, uh, of course, then they wake up in the morning and find out that they've actually won. And very symptomatic of this disconnect and very symptomatic of this sort of crisis of identity. And the interesting thing was, of course, it was probably the first vote that people have had in this country that was actually fully democratic and fully proportional in that everybody here who will have voted had an equal say to anyone else in the country, whether it be Cameron or, you know, it was a proportionally representative vote. And 
as any of you who have been following this will have realized, the implications and the, the kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, the ramifications afterwards, where people were slinging accusations left, right, and center at one another, um, were really quite interesting because, again, symptomatic of this crisis of identity. Um, the leavers were castigated as being sort of ignorant or just, you know, bigots or all the rest of it. Um, and the Remainers were sort of stunned and angry that this could have happened to them, that the certainty that they felt within the status quo was suddenly ripped from under them. You know, it's like somebody pulling the carpet out from, or pulling the tablecloth off on a magic trick, but rather than everything staying there, it kind of all goes all over the place. Um, the idea that people that voted leave were turkeys voting for Christmas is an interesting one, because if you look at the map of people who voted leave. Um, what for me was interesting about it was that other than Scotland and the sort of metropolitan centres, most of the rest of the country voted to exit. And all of those areas were areas that had a very strong sense of identity. They were industrial areas. They were the sort of the powerhouses of the Industrial Revolution. They're farming areas, yeah? And all of these communities over the years have gradually been eroded. Their sense of self, their sense of identity as communities has been taken away from them. Now, I'm not attributing this to any one particular thing. People will say it's the sort of post-Thatcher destruction of the mining communities, destruction of industry. Other people will say that it's actually just progress and that these sort of places couldn't exist anymore. Whatever that is, that's less important than the fact that their sense of identity as communities and hence their sense of identity as individuals for many of these places has been largely eroded. And what I think the Brexit vote gave people, aside from all of the different arguments about migration and all the rest of it, what it gave people was a sense to try and assert a sense of their own identity, to try and sort of claim back some of who they are. Scotland was an exception to this. Obviously, Scotland voted en masse to stay. And I think that that's because Scotland has a very strong sense of its own identity. Um, and always has done, really, you know, and obviously Scottish National Party, the, the, the move for independent Scotland, speaks to that as well. And if you, I don't know if there's any Scots people in the audience, but they, they, they tend to have a very strong sense of self-identity as a, a nation, if you want to call it that. And of course, this has given rise to... <laughs> yeah, can't get enough of them, can you, really? It's fantastic. <laughs> it's given rise to, over the last few years, the, the sort of surge in identity politics. You know, the idea that uh, people are identifying with particular parties or particular figures, less so for the policies that they represent, more so for the characters involved. Now, you like it or loathe him, you know, Donald Trump speaks to something, a yearning deep in the psyche of Americans to have... <laughs> to, <laughs> I really shouldn't have picked that one, should I? It's not going to go down well. But it speaks to something in the psyche of people that they want to identify with something strong. They want to identify with something that, that kind of reflects their sense of self. Okay? And characters like Trump and Boris, bless him, our new foreign secretary. <laughs> Incidentally, sorry, there's a little aside here. Did anybody see the grilling that Boris got by the uh, American journalists recently? Absolutely fantastic. If you've ever sort of get a chance to see it on YouTube, it's brilliant. They were just making him squirm, and it made me think that revenge is definitely a dish best served cold. I think Theresa May is looking at this in thing going, ha oh, ha, gotcha. Anyway, um, back to this. Corbyn, as well. He speaks to an idealism that people want to aspire to. Again, 
love him or loathe him, I'm not really interested in, in the sort of the political side of it. It's how people identify with him and, and how identifying with these people gives back to people that sense of self. And the other thing that's been going on, sort of moving around the collective for a little while now, is um, we had a really bad sort of 18 months for losing people, didn't we? Do you ever remember this? Those of you in England will particularly feel this, I think, because we, we lost so many... This is just a small selection of them. We lost so many stars, celebrities, national treasures. And I always think the concept of national treasures are interesting because they kind of help to define who we are. We've grown up with a lot of these people. They're, they're kind of like part of the furniture. And when they're taken away from us, there's a sense of loss. There's a sense of that identity slipping away. We, 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 know we can't sort of rely on the, the Wogans and the Ronnie Corbett's of this world to be around anymore. And there aren't really people like them coming up to take their place. So there's a bit of a void going on in the collective psyche as these people gradually drop. Well, say gradually drop, they were dropping like flies. We lost an awful lot of them. I can't remember, I lost count, but people were just kind of like, enough already. You know, we don't want to lose any more. Um, and here's just a small selection of them. And the interesting thing with a lot of these people is that they are more than just celebrities to many of us. They are people who are really fundamental in our sense of identity because as we were growing up, they were people we looked up to, they were people we aspired to, especially people in the pop world, you know, celebrities and artists in, in, to do with music. They gave us a really strong sense of who we are at a time when we're very formative in, in, in our sense of self is, is just sort of starting to come into fruition. And so um, artists that make a big impression on us in our psyches when we're growing up, when we lose them, we feel like we've had a really personal loss. It's like, you know, we're kind of grieving for a, a relative or a close friend. And I just wanted to single out one. Now, dear Mr. Bowie, now whether you like him or loathe him, whether you like his music or not, um, you can't really argue with the fact that I think that he was one of the pop culture icons of certainly the late 20th century. His um, constant evolution of his image and, you know, the constant sort of shifting look that he had, the personas that he created, um, were really, really fundamental to a lot of people. Um, he was also very heavily into the occult, which is quite interesting. And uh, his death, if any of you have sort of seen the sort of videos around his last album that he released just shortly, you know, it was literally two days before he died, it was almost like his death was an art piece in itself. Um, and just as a little aside here, let's see if you can spot the subtle Illuminati references in... Glastonbury's main pyramid stage. <laughs> now, I'm sure Mark Devlin might have a few things to say about this later on in the... Um, but this was the tribute to Bowie that was sort of hovering over the pyramid stage for the, the entire uh, Glastonbury Festival. I think somebody there has got a very, very wicked sense of humour. But anyway, back to Bowie itself. Um, he was really a sort of a a pioneer in so many ways, but one of the really interesting things for me um, was his kind of complete ambiguity and fluidity around issues to do with gender. Um, I was a bit young, but my brother remembers quite clearly, you know, him appearing on top of the pops and my dad doing the classic thing of sort of like, mm, who's that? Is that a bloke or a woman? You know, and that kind of reaction, because it was sort of so far ahead of its time in terms of mainstream culture, you know, top of the pops, half the nation viewing it, and this guy comes on 
you know, um, as he says in Rebel Rebel, not sure if you're a boy or a girl, you know. And that kind of uh, playing with gender roles and playing with look and, and imagery um, was deeply, deeply challenging to a lot of people at the time. But in his expression of this, he was seen as, by a lot of young people, um, an incredible role model. Finally, there was somebody in, in the mainstream who, who kind of said, it's okay to express yourself however you are. It's okay to be who you want to be. You know, the, the, There are no rules anymore. There are no kind of boundaries. And that kind of uh, freedom of self-expression was to many people who were growing up at that time incredibly powerful. Um, somebody finally got them. Somebody was, you know, somebody was there that they could look up to. Almost like a saviour figure, you know, finally somebody's coming along who, who gets who I am. And so that's the interplay that we have with a lot of these celebrities. Um, we really identify with them on a very sort of fundamental, profound level. Um, and spoke to people who might have feeling alienated, feeling sort of other. Um, and What's interesting for me with this is that we're moving into an age now where all of the issues that he portrayed in his persona, this kind of sexual fluidity and ambiguity, are now part of the zeitgeist. They're very, very sort of front and centre of our society at the moment. Um, and particularly in the world of the transgender community. Um, we've kind of gone through uh, a sort of a, an arc, if you like, of development, you know. Um, and uh, I was reading something the other day that was sort of saying, that, you know, the, the transgender sort of world is, is uh, where the sort of gay and lesbian world was sort of almost 20 years ago, that all of a sudden it's coming into a mainstream consciousness and a mainstream acceptance and so you've got in across a lot of media now you've got sort of transgender characters and shows about transgender issues that are appearing and it's just accepted it's just there and the interesting thing for me about uh this community and the the way that it's been uh, accepted and brought into the mainstream consciousness um, is that it's largely at its own volition that there is uh, a kind of um, an upturning of the old order by simply bypassing it. If those of you who've done any reading around these issues, there's a whole language, a whole vocabulary that has been created by those people in that community in order to define itself, in order to give itself a sense of identity and a whole kind of lexicon and a whole worldview that really has bypassed any sense of um, the, the prejudices and the things in mainstream society. Now, it's not to say they don't exist anymore, but by creating uh, a coherent identity for themselves, it's kind of like we have to accept that now. That's just part and parcel of our, uh, our world moving forwards. And the freedom to express your true self in that way, I think, is very important. And it's also a very Aquarian uh, quality. You know, we're moving into the age of Aquarius astrologically. Um, and that is an age of fluidity. It's an age that is, is somewhat amorphous and has this very fluid, malleable, changeable quality to it. So this fits into me perfectly with, with that sense in the wider world. It's a good example of how people can take and, and reclaim their sense of self in it, within a community and also within as individuals too. But this is obviously challenging to a lot of people who um, may see developments, not just this one, but any developments as, as sort of corrosive and potentially sort of threatening to, you know, their worldview and the sort of status quo as it is. But really that ship sailed, I think. You know, that, 
is now past, and it's up to those people in society to to kind of accept, integrate, and if you like, um, be okay with the changes that are happening right the way across the board. But this identity crisis, I think that society and people and individuals are suffering from also has a dark side to it because in trying to maintain our sense of identity um, there can be a sense of fear about your own viewpoint and about your own sense of self and this became clear to me when I started reading about the phenomenon of no platforming any of you come across this before? Okay, so the first time I really became aware of this, and it sort of harks back to the gender thing, was Germaine Greer, you know, the, the sort of great sort of feminist writer and, and thinker, um, said some fairly controversial things about the transgender community. And she was due to speak at a university. I can't remember which one it was now. And the university... Uh, it was a NUS debating society, I think, that were, were having her on as a speaker, decided they were going to no-platform her. And no-platforming is actually a policy amongst the NUS, the National Union of Students in, in this country, whereby they will not give um, space to people whose... Um, it was originally started, really, to sort of prevent people with extremist views having a voice. Um, but... It started to bleed over into stopping people who have a contrary viewpoint to your own having a platform. Um, now, love her or loathe her, Jermaine Greer is a thinker of some repute, and whether you like her opinions or not, I think that the idea that voices are stifled in this way can be very, very dangerous. Is the question of is it legitimate to not give people a voice or does it speak to a sense of uncertainty and a sense of um, insecurity in your own viewpoint? And this is going on throughout universities across the country and, and across the world as well. It's a phenomenon in America too. Um, and I think it's actually quite dangerous. Stifling debate in this way, it has a habit of narrowing an orthodoxy so that differing ideas aren't heard. Um, and I don't believe personally that that can be good for the collective, because I think that the only way we move forwards as individuals and as a society is through debate and education. I think that shutting down points of view, no matter how difficult we might find them, is very, very uh, corrosive. It's a bit of a slippery slope. And it's not too difficult to extrapolate from the idea of no platforming um, a state of censorship where certain ideas and certain values and certain um, philosophies can't be spoken about. And we need to be very, very careful of that. Now, we now have a Prime Minister in this country, the delightful Theresa May, who, as Home Secretary, uh, vowed to stamp out non-violent extremism. What is non-violent extremism? How do you define non-violent extremism? Is it extremist to say, I don't actually believe that the official events of, uh, the official account of 9-11 is accurate. It's very easy to think of it as defined as extremism because it runs against the orthodoxy, it runs against the mainstream view. So this idea of stifling debate and stifling points of view that are differing and, and that we don't like, I think is a, a very, very slippery slope to be on. So it could very easily be that a conference like this, where we're discussing fairly radical ideas, 
could soon be labelled as extremism in some people's eyes. And, you know, we could all be criminals at some point. I know it sounds a bit far-fetched, but it's not actually that far-fetched. It's a gradual erosion, and this is the sort of thing that starts it. Okay? One of the things that has definitely gone underground as a result of no platforming um, is the whole movement known as the Manosphere. Have any of you ever come across this? It's an interesting subculture and uh, quite a murky one when you start sort of researching it. This guy, uh, known as Roosh V, um, he describes himself as a pickup artist, uh, which is, okay, call it what you like. But when he was due to come over here to give a series of workshops, um, the tabloids went absolutely mad. Well, actually, all the papers went mad over it. Um, and he was dubbed as the rape guru. Um, as a pickup artist, uh, his philosophy is that um, essentially, sex is a commodity, and if you know how to play the game of the commodity, if you can know how to play the commodities market, um, you can be successful as a bloke in picking up any woman. Okay, and so he has workshops where he sort of teaches techniques for you know how to make sure that you can pick up any woman that you like. He even gives people a sexual market value. So you, as one of his followers, you you know you you're you're supposed to uh, kind of increase your sexual market value by you know building your body and making yourself sure you look good and you know being well learned and things like that. Um, and it's really quite um, interesting. I mean, he, he was so controversial. They actually spoke about him in Parliament as well. Questions were raised over here. And I think he ended up not coming. Um, he's certainly been banned in quite a lot of countries that have sort of refused him entry. Um, and of course, what that's done is it's driven the whole thing underground. So on the internet, there's this whole sort of subculture. It's not massive, but as I'll explain later on, I think it, its influence can be quite corrosive, um, called the Manosphere. It's the sort of collective name given to these various sort of websites and forums and things, uh, you know, meeting places, um, where blokes get together and talk about how crap women are <laughs> and how um, manipulative and it's it's it's. I almost kind of struggle to to kind of explain it. You have to kind of be in there, but it's kind of like wading through shit going into places like that because it's just sort of this very corrosive atmosphere. Um, and they kind of have this very odd sense of the masculine and the feminine. You know, they kind of hark back to some 1950s ideal where the, the kind of guy comes home in his, his kind of nice great big car and says, hi, honey, is my dinner ready yet? And, you know, and the subservient wife is there to kind of, you know, fulfill all the needs. It, 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 it's this weird kind of uh, melee of ideas. And some of it is, is sort of very utopian. And if you read their sort of manifesto, some of it seems very reasonable. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of extolling people not to look at pornography, to, to further yourself spiritually and, and mentally and, you know, kind of be the best person that you can be. But what strikes me with all of this is that inherent in this, there is a deep, deep fear of the feminine. Um, and I'm not talking about women, I'm talking about the feminine. And we know that both of the, you know, all, all, both sexes have uh, both masculine and feminine qualities within them. But there strikes me that there is this deep, deep fear of the feminine within this whole kind of worldview. 
um, it gets there's a subset within the manosphere of this they call themselves MGTOW men going their own way these men hate women so much that they're kind of advocating living life without them yes I'm getting some cheers from female sounding voices there <laughs> Can't say I blame you a lot of the time. <laughs> They're rejecting women entirely. And obviously, this is a complete fallacy, this approach. You know, it just can't work. They're kind of, and, and there's this curious, curious sort of dissonance between these ideas. Because obviously, if you have a, wim a world without women entirely, does that mean you're going to become gay? Because that's the only option left. But they hate gays. Oh. <laughs> and, and, and the kind of, <laughs> the upshot of all this is that, is that you, you, as you sort of go down, it's curious, they call it the Red Pill Society. Okay, that's the, the red pill is, is this sort of term that they use for having sort of, you know, in, in, in the matrix, you can take the blue pill and everything sort of remains the same and you remain in ignorance. But if you take the red pill, you go down the rabbit hole of enlightenment, sorry, enlightenment and awareness. And so they call themselves the Red Pill Society because they've woken up to the great sort of, uh, um, the, the great sort of, game that's being played and, and the way that women are pulling the wool over the eyes of the men and that feminism is kind of, you know, they call them feminazis. And it's, it's, it's a very, very odd kind of, um, to me, slightly ill thought through set of ideas and, and philosophies and principles. Um, but there's an interesting thing behind this. If you can put aside the sheer offensiveness and ridiculousness of it, um, what for me is really interesting about it is that there's a behind all of this is a deep yearning for a masculine ideal. And one of the interesting things that harks back to what I was talking about earlier on about a sense of identity, about a sense of self, is that I think particularly for young men in today's society, there is a complete lack of any sense of the masculine self. And in our circles, in terms of sort of new age thought and development and things like that, there's been an awful lot of uh, work done on, on bringing back the divine feminine and, and the importance of that. And, and that is vital that we do that. But there's been less attention played to, uh, put, um, played to the, the idea of the masculine in order to counterbalance that. And that's not just for men, it's for all of us something's been lost. And as I was talking about earlier on, you know, the, the, with, the, with the Brexit vote, this might seem a little bit of a, a, a sort of circuitous uh, route to come around, but we've lost a lot of the rites of passage of the sort of traditional values that defined men. And I'm not saying as the manosphere advocates would do, that we need to go back to that, but we need to come up with something new that works for the new age that we're in. Um, as industry has changed, you know, we're kind of no, long in, no longer in that position where, you know, you were a boy and then you became a man when you got your first job. We've got this kind of blurring of the whole sort of developmental process and nothing has replaced it. There's a void and a vacuum. And I think it's that vacuum that the manosphere speaks to and people like Rouge V. It, it kind of appeals to people that are feeling lost and no sense of identity. Um, and it's important. It's important that we come up with something to replace this because um, what have young men in this society got as role models? You know, absent of anything else, we're talking for a lot of people, we're talking, you know, rap artists, we're talking kind of gang culture, because that gives them a sense of masculinity. It's a twisted masculinity, but it gives them it nonetheless. Um, and the problem with not having anything to replace those things is that 
misogyny is an ever-growing issue in society, um, and it's causing a huge, huge disconnect. And if you don't think this is sort of going mainstream, if you think this is just limited to a fringe element within our society, uh, this was in Maxim magazine. Turn a, an unshaven, militant, protesting vegan into an actual girl. The simple stages of how you do it. Now, this is a mainstream, all right, it's a bloke's magazine, all right? You know, it's got pictures of scantily clad women on it. You know, it's designed to appeal to blokes. But nevertheless, I think this is pretty corrosive. I think this speaks to the disconnect that a lot of young men feel when this kind of thing is considered okay. But there's a solution to all of this. I made a rod from my own back, actually, in writing that little blurb that's in your programs, because I, I mentioned sex robots, and I have to get them in there somewhere. <laughs> but this is kind of like, I know it's slightly absurdist, but this is happening, this is real, and this is going to be happening increasingly over the next few years. People are actually building robots that you can essentially have sex with. The ones down here on the right-hand side, they're, they're, they're just dolls. They don't do anything other than be passive, which would probably appeal to quite a lot of the blokes in the manosphere. That's their ideal partner. The fact that it can't cook is just a sort of a minor annoyance. <laughs> they're stunningly realistic. That's the frightening thing. You know, they're not the kind of comedy thing that you <laughs> pump up anymore. But the guy that develops these, which cost about seven grand a pop, and you can specify them just the way you want them, is trying to put artificial intelligence into them. He's trying to put animatronics into them. He's trying to make them into kind of... Living Dolls, as Cliff Richard. I don't think that's what he was kind of <laughs> thinking of when he wrote the song. Um, and, of course, for some people, this is the answer to their prayers. If I sort of channel my working men's club comic at the moment, you know, there's half of the men here going, where can I sign up for that? And half the women going, you know, do they do one that does the ironing? <laughs> but for a lot of people, you know, this is appealing. And what's the cost of that, though? This idea that we're kind of moving into an ever more virtual society where real human interaction, where all the, the, the kind of the hard, messy stuff that makes relationships so rewarding and so fulfilling is taken away. Um, and this kind of thing is, is on a continuum, really, because, you know, we, we we're living in a world with ever more virtualized relationships where people are kind of just, you know, madly. It's the classic thing of two people sitting across from the table one another and they're texting or Facebooking or WhatsApping one another, you know. We're kind of moving into a world where that becomes uh, increasingly commonplace. And I'm not necessarily saying that's a bad thing in terms of the fluidity with which we can communicate with one another. But the, uh, the actual sort of disconnect between real human interaction is um, something that I think we need to become more concerned about because that skews our sense of self. That skews our sense of identity and who we are. And where does that all lead? Okay. I'm going to make a little leap here. I think that those values, that this crisis in the sense of self and the crisis in sort of the masculine sense of self as well, has its peak, if you like, in organizations like ISIS. Stick with me here for a minute. Because if you think about it, ISIS as an organization is kind of 
Well, it's two things. It's the repression of our darkest, it's the expression of our darkest fears. Okay, it's very much the terrorist organization for the Aquarian age because it sort of almost seems to have no form. It can spring up anywhere you like. Um, and I think that all the while we do not talk about things uh, like the ideas of you know, increasing misogyny in society and things like that, if we suppress that, it pops up in organizations like ISIS. Um, it's a patriarchal, a patriarchal system that is deeply misogynist at its core. Okay? Um, it's the expression of all of our darkest fears as a collective. It puts those fears into sort of stark relief. Um, it's the ultimate expression, if you like, of the twisted masculine. Mars unfettered. Um, and I think that's why it's so attractive to a lot of people. And I read a really interesting article the other day that was talking about the connection between uh, domestic violence and misogyny and the, uh, the rise of things like mass shootings in America and terrorist acts. And a lot of the people that perpetrate these acts have one thing in common, that they've all been reported to have very, very dysfunctional uh, relationships with either their mothers or female members of their family or just female member, you know, members of the opposite sex generally. Um, and what we tend to do as a society is we tend to say, oh, no, 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 they're very other. You know, we, and in the case of ISIS, we label it as a Muslim problem. Okay, but I think that that is almost um, a slight aside from the real appeal of organizations like this to a lot of young men. People go, you know, it's in the press all the time in this country, why do people run off to join it? Well, this is the kind of twisted masculine's ideal fantasy. You get to go and fight, you get to go and oppress women, and it's all for a holy cause. What could be better? And by not looking at that side of it, not looking at the appeal of an organization like this, abhorrent though it is, um, and I'm no way an apologist for anything that they do, they are totally abhorrent, but we need to look at the fact of why people are attracted to it, because I think it speaks to a, a continuum, if you like, and they're at one end of it, and our own sort of sense of self and, and identity crisis is at the other end of it. Okay, thank you. So, I guess, how do, we, how do we tackle this? I think it's a really hard, hard problem to tackle because I think it sort of cuts to the very core of who we are as a society and who we are as a people. Um, and it becomes very difficult to then sort of label one particular approach that will work as a, as a sort of a cure-all. I don't think there is one. And I think it's one of the sort of most difficult kind of questions of our time. How we give people back a sense of self that is balanced, um, that is nuanced, that can accept other opposing views, if you like, and, and differing ideas, and treat them with respect and dignity. And part of it has to do with honoring the masculine and the feminine. And I'm not talking again, just to reiterate about men and women, I'm talking about those qualities within us that we have a, a greater or lesser amount of. Um, it's bringing that into balance within us in whichever way is most appropriate for our needs. And it's also about turning the rocks over and looking underneath and seeing the shadow side of life as well. Because I think that in 
having that uncertainty in people's identities and people's sense of self, there is often a tendency to, to actually not look at those sides, to actually sort of deny that, which is what the no platforming thing is about. Don't challenge me, don't challenge those things that I'm not comfortable with, okay? And we need to, we need to engender a society where those types of discussions can be had in a way that doesn't threaten people and that actually begets learning and begets uh, a development of the soul and of the self. It's quite interesting that societies that don't have all the trappings of Westernism, the consumerism, the sort of overload of information, all the rest of it, societies that are often in crisis have the strongest foundation and the strongest sense of self. I know Paldon spoke about this a few years ago at the symposium when he was talking about his experiences in Palestine. And, you know, um, it's... Yeah, it's, a, it's a country that's ravaged and war-torn and the people there have absolutely nothing and they're under constant hardship, they're under constant attack. But what they do have is an incredible sense of who they are and an incredible cohesion as a community. They will help one another. They know the value of taking simple pleasures in the everyday. They, they use all the tools that they have in order to make an impossibly hard life bearable. And in doing so, their sense of self is very strong and their soul as a community is very strong as well. It's very deep. It runs through them almost like a stick of rock. And we need to get some of those values into our own society. And it's important I think in order to do that, that there are guides to show us the way and mentors, elders, people who've lived a little bit and can act as a beacon and a guiding light for, I think, a generation that have, by and large, lost their sense of self and are very confused about that. So I think that for both men and women, having forums, some kind of interaction where that can take place is vital. And we've kind of lost that. You know, as families have become fragmented, we've moved from the extended family to the nuclear family. Yes, there were situations where prejudices are passed down and, and ideas that are no longer kind of relevant or serving for the society in which we live are passed down. And that's always going to be the case. But I think with wisdom and with a bit of uh, care, the value of the wisdom of the elders is something that we need to reintegrate into society. Um, and it's very interesting where they've done experiments where they've sort of matched up sort of, you know, young school kids with the, with the elderly in society who they've never, ever had any contact with prior to this other than maybe, you know, kind of going around their grands for sort of tea once a week. When they've actually started to kind of um, bring these two groups together that have never really existed in the past or interacted in the past, something really interesting happens and that the common ground between them is discovered and the youngsters really, really value having elders in their lives, having people that they can talk to who are not necessarily family members, who are independent, but have that wisdom of having lived a full life. You know, the youngsters love it and the elders feel invigorated and much younger as a result of it. So it's a kind of win-win situation. Um, so that really kind of sums up what I wanted to say. Um, we need to change the way we are. I think that's sort of fairly self-evident. And groups like this, um, forums like this, are a great way of expanding that sort of consciousness. But the idea now 
is to take that out into the wider world and make it relevant to people who do not have um, necessarily the same world view, but that experience and that um, sharing can only be good to foster a sense of individual identity and also the wider community at large. Um, so I hope I got through everything in my little list that I wrote. I think I did. Thank you for listening. Justin Porthouse, thank you very much. Thank you. That's brilliant stuff. Thank you, Jason.